welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry, and social justice. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Mad in America podcast. This week in psychology, we covered some fascinating research news. In a new study, e- researchers used EEG technology to discern antidepressant effectiveness and found no difference whatsoever when compared to placebo. Other research has found barely any consensus in the way patients on antipsychotics and experts in the field understand what causes their symptoms. And lastly, a new commentary in academic psychiatry asserts that psychology needs to pay serious attention to the social and structural determinants of health, and not just to internal and individual concerns. This last study specifically lends itself beautifully to what will be our discussion today, for we have Dr. Ian Parker as our guest on the podcast. Dr. Parker is a fellow of the British Psychological Society, Emeritus Professor at University of Leicester, and the Managing Editor of Annual Review of Critical Psychology. He has written over 15 books in numerous languages and has a new one coming out soon. And we will discuss that and a lot more. Dr. Parker, welcome to Mad in America. How are you Hi, today? Hi, thanks. Thanks for having me here. Um, all right. So let me just dive in um, to the questions. So the first thing I wanted to ask is that a lot of what we will talk about is called critical psychology. So before we get into anything, could you tell our um, listeners about what critical psychology is and what started your interest in this field? Well, critical psychology is a way of stepping back and looking at the discipline of the psycho- uh, discipline of psychology rather than taking what the psychologists say for granted. Mm-hmm. So instead of turning the gaze around and looking at normal people who are the non-psychologists, the critical psychologists turn the gaze around and look at what the psychologists are doing. Basically, that's how I understand critical psychology. It's a reflexive look at right. what psychology is doing. And of course, that extends to psychiatry and psychotherapy and psychoanalysis. Uh, looking at the ways in which they try to determine our behavior, the way that they guess about the way that we think, the way that they specify different kinds of disorder for us, and turning things back and asking critical questions about what they're doing. Uh, All right. Thank you for that. So um, what started your interest in studying critical psychology? Was there like a big moment or something like that? Or it was just, you know, you always were interested in it. Well, the first time I came across the phrase was back in 1985 in Plymouth. It was the first conference of the International Society for Theoretical Psychology. Mm -hmm. Uh, I went to this conference because I was a student in Plymouth and I just finished my psychology degree there. And at this conference, there were speakers from Germany from a tradition called Kritische Psychology, or critical psychology. Mm -hmm. So that was the first time that I heard the phrase. And this kind of work that they were talking about, which was inspired by the psychologist Klaus Holzkamp, who's now dead, Uh, but uh, this kind of work that they were talking about was incredibly boring Um, and seemed to be devoted to setting up an alternative theoretical system that mirrored, in a bizarre way, the kinds of things that I'd been learning about in my psychology degree. So I was interested in the label, critical psychology, but it took me a while to feel comfortable using it myself. And it was only later on with the work of people like Valerie Walkerdine in Britain and John Broughton in the uh, in United States, that the term critical psychology started to have some resonance for me because in that later form of critical psychology that was developing in the English-speaking world, mm-hmm. it was also looking reflexively at issues like feminism and anti-colonial work and different kinds of oppression. So it was picking up the kind of critical psychology that I'm interested in today is picking up the strands of the radical psychology movement that was around in the 1960s and 1970s. So it took me a while to be comfortable with it, but but now 
I'm happy enough using <laughs> that label sometimes. Okay. Uh, I, I noticed that you used another label, radical psychology. So uh, let me kind of talk about that for a second. Since a lot of our listeners are interested in questions of mental health and mental illness and, you know, some of the subversive ideas around what these concepts, could you um, maybe talk a little bit about uh, radical psychology's uh, contribution to specifically the fields of, you know, um, what we call abnormal psychology or mental health or mental illness, uh, something in those um, lines? Yeah, I think the most important thing is that we build alliances. So instead of building the theory first and then mm -hmm. telling people the good news about what radical psychology is or mm -hmm. what critical psychology is, we build alliances with people in practice to learn from the way that people have experienced the mental health system right. and to draw on their stories, to draw on their experiences, to work together to challenge what our colleagues in psychology are doing. So the most important aspects of radical psychology and critical psychology have been in the meetings which bring together users of psychology services and psychiatry services and psychotherapy services, bring them together with professionals who are starting to think critically about what they're doing, starting to worry about what they're doing, and with academics who are doing some of the theoretical work and are interested in the ideas. So mm -hmm. it's those three aspects, the, the users of the services, the professionals and the academics, work, bringing them together um, and building something which is a kind of movement um, that, that is most important. And it's from that that the ideas start to emerge. Right. So it's, uh, it's the expertise through experience kind of a model, right? So you talked about um, professionals and academics who, uh, who are rather worried about the way, you know, for the lack of a better phrase, we deliver these services and we deal with the people around us when we uh, at least attempt at helping them. So uh, have you found that a lot? Like a lot of professionals are concerned about the way we're doing psychology or is it something that you still just find on the margins and, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you still find it on the margins. Um, but, but it's interesting. If you look at the, um, the critical psychiatry movement and the yes. anti-psychiatry movement, it's always been led by psychiatrists. Right. And if you look at people like R.D. Lang or Thomas Sass or Marius Roma, uh, Franco Basaglia mm -hmm. from different parts of the world, you find that these people were trained as psychiatrists and then they start to see that there's something seriously wrong in what they're doing, that it's not helping people and that they need to find alternatives. And what they do is reach out beyond the discipline to find people to talk to and to think critically about what they're doing. So, yes, there are, there are people there in psychiatry and in psychology who, who are worried about the kind of knowledge that they're developing and about the, the practices. It's a really important part of it. Back in the 1980s, when we tried to build a movement which was called Psychology Politics Resistance in Britain, right. we went up to North Manchester, which is a poorer part of the city, to talk to some psychologists uh, who we knew were radicals about psychology politics resistance. We wanted to get them involved. And I remember going along one lunchtime uh, they just had half an hour for lunch. They were willing to sit and eat their sandwiches and talk to us. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And we explained what psychology politics resistance was. And they said, look, we haven't got time to do any psychology. We do housing advice and welfare support and helping people to develop networks. Mm -hmm. Actually, they were doing radical work. And I think they knew that the psychology that they'd been taught wasn't actually any use at all. And so they were doing more useful things. They were doing other things with their time. And it's those kinds of people that, that we really need to, to connect with. People right. who already know that psychology is no use, uh, that it simply is a sticking plaster for problems, and that the sticking plaster actually makes things worse. <laughs> a lot of people right. are allergic to <laughs> sticking plaster. <laughs> uh, so, so what critical psychology is, is, is a different way of thinking about psychology as a really weird, a really um, unhelpful system of theories and practices and putting it on under the spotlight.
Uh, it's really interesting that you say that uh, it was psychiatrists very often who came up with some of these, you know, radical critiques of the way we were doing psychology because um, I was covering the de deprescription movement. So there is a global thing around, you know, that we need to um, deprescribe and de-diagnose people. And uh, the movement itself is emerging from, from the medical field and not from psychology. Yeah. And yeah, so uh, that is interesting. It's doctors more than psychologists who are like, you know, we're over-diagnosing and over-medicating people. And even though, again, these uh, critiques are on the margins, it's still helpful to see that at least someone is initiating a conversation. But it isn't coming from inside psychology. And we use a lot of those drugs they're talking about. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Uh, that's because uh, a lot of psychologists just take for granted the the information that they get from mainstream psychiatry right. and right. they they don't think about what it means uh, uh, in fact because there's a kind of pecking order uh, there's a pecking order with the mm -hmm. psychiatrists at the top um, and then the psychologists and then the psychotherapists and then the poor counselors at the bottom of the heap right. um, and the psychologists want to be like psychiatrists right. so the psychologists always defer to the psychiatrists and do what the psychiatrists say and and take take what the psychiatrists say on good coin. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, it, we need to connect with the critical psychiatrists as well who are, who are starting to unravel these claims that, 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 that the medical psychiatry makes. All right, thank you for that. Um, let me move on to the next question then. Um, so uh, this last year, and actually the last few years, the whole decade, um, there have been cracks developing in the discipline of psychology. Um, even people are, you know, admitting... Uh, in the mainstream fields that there is a problem. So um, I remember covering some work in which researchers found that most psychology journals and papers in these journals spin their abstracts to appear a certain way, even if the results are, you know, insignificant and or not found. And then others have been writing about this deep, pervasive industry influence in research and practice and even education. And uh, I know that you, your new book, uh, Criti Psychology Through Critical Autoethnography, it devotes significant time to your experience in these areas, research and teaching and practice of psychology. And um, I, I know that you've critiqued the traditional methods that are used in research. So um, my first question would be, what did you find lacking in the way psychology was performing its research? Uh, and the way it was being taught in universities. So I'm basically asking about the research and the teaching part. I mean, most of the most of the psychology that's carried out today is still quantitative. Mm -hmm. It's still reducing people to numbers. It's still combining people together in the experiments and uh, giving broad, general statements about human behaviour and cognition, mm -hmm. which don't take account of the individual experience and meaning that people give to their lives. Uh, I was lucky when I was doing my psychology degree that there were some alternative qualitative approaches being discussed. Uh, and those approaches were based on the idea that psychology needed a paradigm revolution. Right. You know, a paradigm revolution in science is one that changes the fundamental coordinates, the ways of thinking about what the academic discipline is. Right. If you take as, uh, as an example, um, in astronomy, mm -hmm. once upon a time, we thought that all the planets went round the Earth. Right. But a paradigm revolution in astronomy, which was um, pro provoked by uh, Copernicus and then Galileo mm -hmm. with the development of the telescopes, showed us that this was wrong and that we needed to shift to a new paradigm in which we understood that the planets circulated around each other and that the Earth was just one of these planets moving around. Now, we need a similar kind of paradigm revolution in psychology. That's what I was told when I was a student, and I, I still take this very seriously. Right. Uh, we need a paradigm that treats people as if they're human beings instead of as objects. You know, the old paradigm in psychology is an experimental paradigm that is still very powerful, which treats people as if they are objects, push and pull objects, so that right. you do things to them and you don't take seriously what they say about what they do. Mm -hmm. The new paradigm would be a paradigm that actually 
works with the meanings that people give to their experiences as individual meanings. And that, that would completely transform psychology. That would really be a new paradigm. Right. Now, that new paradigm was being argued for by a philosopher of science, Rom Hare, mm -hmm. uh, who uh, died last October. Sadly, uh, he was an advocate for new methods in psychology. Uh, he believed that there would be a new paradigm and argued for most of his life for this new paradigm, qualitative research paradigm. Mm -hmm. And he argued that it would be more scientific than the old paradigm because it would take seriously what human beings were and what they could do. Well, the paradigm revolution failed. Psychology right. departments are still experimental, laboratory-based departments. They use that old paradigm. And so, to be honest, I think I've come to the conclusion that I give up. I give up now on trying to change psychology. We've got to right. start somewhere else. Wow. Um, where, where would you like to start? Like, um, and maybe what you were talking about earlier with the actual people who are working um, and who have who have told you that we're not even trying to do psychology anymore. We're trying to look at housing and all of these. That's right. Is that a and connecting with the people who've been trained as psychologists or psychiatrists mm -hmm. or psychotherapists and talking to them about what they do, what they actually do, mm -hmm. and trying to seize the radical spaces, open up every little radical space. You, know, you talked about the cracks mm -hmm. that are opening up, and I right. think you're absolutely right. There have always been cracks. There have always been little openings, and we've got to work with the people who are there trying to open things up uh, right. inside and connect them with the people outside who are actually subjected to these kind of theories and practices. Could you give us an example of that, like a time that that has been done um, or a time that you would like to see it done, something that you observed in which somebody chipped away at these cracks and something quite incredible was, was done with it? Yeah, I, well, I, I mean, I suppose the uh, an example that may be well known to to listeners is the hearing voices movement, right. the network of people who hear voices and right. they think about those voices in different ways. Sometimes they have spiritualist explanations for those voices. Sometimes they have kind of computer model explanations for those voices. Um, different kinds of explanations, but they find that mainstream psychiatry and psychology pathologizes their experience and tells them that there's something wrong with them if they mm -hmm. hear voices. You know, in the old DSM, uh, hearing of voices was treated as a first-rank symptom of schizophrenia. Right. Absolutely. So, you know, if you, if you were, if you were unhappy, unlucky enough to tell a psychiatrist that you heard voices, then, then you'd be very likely to be given that diagnosis and end up in some really bad medication right. as a result. The Hearing Voices Network uh, that uh, developed, uh, first of all, in Holland and then spread to Britain and then has spread around the world is exactly that kind of initiative that gives a different space for people to reflect on their on their experiences and to work together to share their ideas so that they can uh, learn about what the medication is doing. They can learn when they want to take the medication. Mm -hmm. They can be in control of the process. And so we shift the balance of power from the professionals to the users of services. That would be a, a one example that, uh, that has been a marvelous um, right. kind of shining light for, for critical research, I think, and for critical practice. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and especially so re so relevant in uh, in a time when we, the FDA recently approved the digital antipsychotic. I'm not sure if you know about this. So um, it's quite interesting to see on one hand, we're trying to, there are these voices in the margins trying to um, uh, have the service users, you know, be able to make choices in what they want to put in their body and not. And on the other hand, you have approval of something that will send out an electric signal saying whether this person has taken their medication or not. Sounds like, uh, you know, someone who's already dealing with paranoia's worst nightmare. Yeah. So <laughs> there is that. Thank you for answering that. Let me uh, move on to the next question now. A lot of your work has been, um, you know, placing psychology in a political and a cultural context. Uh, in the way psychology understands why people do the things they do, what they think of as abnormal and not normal, and what they see, what they feel, 
And um, you've talked about how all of this and the way psychology understands these things is deeply interconnected with powerful ideological and institutional forces. And uh, today the DSM claims that, you know, it's definitely culturally sensitive and it pays attention to context. But researchers like uh, Joseph Kahn and Melanie Langa have actually talked about that the DSM, sure, it's trying to do these things, but at the same time, it fails the experience of, for example, um, Native Americans in the United States. And uh, so researchers have been critical of these claims that you know have been made. Um, my first question to you is, um, for our listeners, what is it? What do you mean by trying to put psychology in a political and a cultural context and paying attention to these really strong, powerful ideological and institutional forces? Well, I think what we often find when we talk to people who have given these diagnoses is that they have their own personal explanations and understandings of their experience. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. But the second thing, which is also incredibly important, is that they share experiences with, with other people who suffer the same kinds of oppression, oppression as being a woman, of, of being a black person, of being lesbian or gay or trans, uh, that, they, that their similar experiences come across. And that's why the self-help groups that bring together people who are subjected to psychology or psychiatry right. are so important because it's in that way that they develop a consciousness of those shared meanings that are given to them and, and shared forms of pathology mm -hmm. that are handed down to them by the medical professions and by the psychologists. So that, that cultural context is absolutely crucial. I right. suppose my first, my first way into this was um, not through specific cultural difference as such, but my first way into it was through feminism. When I was doing my psychology degree, I was talking all the time to people doing social work courses and soci sociology courses and welfare courses in the university. Um, and they were more critical right. of, of the knowledge that they were given. And they were very much influenced by the women's movement and of the ways in which men were pathologized in many, many different ways by social and welfare services and the way that psychologists and psychiatrists reinforce that kind of pathologization, that kind of uh, oppression. I, I was doing some a joint thing a few years ago with a behavioral psychologist in Manchester University and uh, in the class described how uh, he had a patient uh, who was worried about her weight. He put her on the scales and he weighed her and he showed her what her weight was. Uh, in order to show her, facts were about her weight. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the students in the audience piped up and said, but what, what did she mean by thinking that she was losing weight or... Uh, 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 you know, had had the wrong weight, and uh, my colleague said immediately it meant she was wrong. <laughs> oh wow! Okay. <laughs> now uh, that for me summed up right uh, the main problem with a cognitive behavioural approach. Now, mm -hmm. having said that, I know I have lots of friends and colleagues who do cognitive behavioural therapy and do it in a more sensitive way. But the problem is that it leads the psychologist into this kind of way of thinking that they, they know best and that right. you can show people what reality is and bring people back in line with that reality. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the main problem with that? The main problem is that the reality of life today in the world is that we live in a deeply unequal society in which different people are given different rights to speak men, usually white men, older white men <laughs> like me, <laughs> uh, are the ones who do most of the talking um, and other voices don't really get a look in. Uh, and, and, and when people do talk about their own experiences, they're told that they're wrong. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. If you try and just adjust people to reality all the time, then you, you really need to 
step back and think about how this reality is structured. Psychology isn't the only problem. Psychology is part of a broader set Mm -hmm. of problems to do with the distribution of power in the world. The problem is that it reinforces that distribution of power. And that's why psychology and psychiatry works so well, because psychology and psychiatry fits perfectly, hand in glove, with this terrible reality that we live in at the moment. So we have a broader task, and this is why the social movement aspect of critical psychology Mm -hmm. is so crucial. We have a broader task of building a movement that doesn't only change psychology and psychiatry, but also changes the world so that we don't need psychology and psychiatry anymore. So uh, then let me ask you this, because uh, we're on the subject right now, since you talked about the unequal distribution of power and how psychology and psychiatry can kind of um, uh, reintroduce the same problems uh, while sometimes pretending to solve them. So, uh, or maybe not even that. So my question is that, is that, is that why you have looked really deeply into the relationship between psychology and Marxism? And uh, to, my, uh, to our listeners, could you say a little bit about how Marxist theory adds to psychology? What is its place in psychology, uh, according to your work? Yeah. Um, well, before I started training as a psychologist, I was a Marxist. Right. Uh, maybe that helped. Yeah. I, I, I never <laughs> believed psychology. Uh, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, in fact, uh, the, the, the col- comrades uh, in the uh, group that I was in, uh, before I started training as a psychologist, said, well, why are you doing this? Because psychology is a, as a bourgeois discipline. Mm-hmm. It individualizes experience. Uh, it has nothing to offer people. Uh, we need to change the world instead of going into psychology. Um, and I thought, well, actually, that's the reason why I want to go into it. I want to go in and find out how it works. Right. Because there are lots of people go into psychology thinking that they're going to help people. But they end up, just acting as part of the apparatus of psychology. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go in and, uh, I mean, my latest book is about autoethnography. It's about kind of being a little anthropologist and going into this strange world and describing what I found. Um, But I did do that right from the beginning. I didn't go in to become a psychologist. I went in to find out how it works. And, And so I always had Marxism there as my guiding framework and uh, I need to make it very clear that when I say Marxism I mean the attempt by people to collectively work together to take the means of production into their own hands and determine their own lives Mm -hmm. Uh, that's all it means it doesn't mean endorsing the Soviet Union or China or any of these other terrible regimes that have turned Marxism into a kind of belief system or into a kind of uh, religious system. It doesn't mean uh, 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 falling in line with that. Uh, I come from a strand of Marxism that was always very critical of uh, the rise of Stalin and Stalinism. Uh, I'm a Trotskyist. (laughs) Uh, And Uh, So I'm concerned with bringing people together and enabling them to work collectively to find solutions to their problems. And in that process, they come up against the capitalist state and the large corporations that have an interest in maintaining their power and keeping us all docile and obedient. We need to stop being docile and obedient, and we Mm -hmm. need collectively to work together to become what we are, that is, collective beings thinking reflexively about what we're doing and for me that's what marxism is marxism is a theory and a practice of contradiction mainly class contradiction but but also other kinds of contradiction in society first and change continual change so we need to look today at the way that this ability that we have to change our lives is being blocked, the way it's being obstructed, the way that those with power who have an interest in maintaining their power are doing their level best to tell us we can't change things for ourselves and to tell us that every Marxist is a filthy red who wants to impose a dictatorship, every feminist is a man-hater who wants to destroy men, every lesbian is a pervert who wants to 
overturn every kind of morality right. and every black activist is someone who wants to kill the white people. No, we can all work together and build a better world. And we don't, we need to reject the lies that are being fed to us about the social movements that are trying to do something positive. So since you talked about uh, entering the discipline of psychology as a Marxist, and I'm sure, like you said, it helped you maintain that critical gaze. Uh, let me ask you then, um, what were some of the challenges you faced when you were trying to do this work? Um, if you have any, um, any stories or examples or just uh, an overview of what were some of the pushbacks, and I'm sure you experienced a lot of it. Uh, the main problem is that people are very committed to the theoretical frameworks that they've been trained in. Right. When someone has been through a psychology degree for three or four or five years, and they trained to become a psychologist, then it's quite understandable that they will be committed to that knowledge and that practice. They want to hold very tight to the status and the qualifications that they have. Mm -hmm. And they often feel very threatened when people challenge that knowledge. I suppose what I saw over the years uh, when I was teaching psychology in Manchester, uh, it was in Manchester Metropolitan University. Right. In those years when I taught psychology, I, I found that, that, that there were some people who were willing to listen to the new ideas, but that there were often people who were very defensive and, and uh, very uh, threatened by, by new ideas and by challenges to psychology. I'll give you an example. Um, the founding of the Hearing Voices Network uh, came when a patient of the psychiatrist Marius Roma right. challenged him. Yes. And this patient was called Patsy Hager. Mm -hmm. And Patsy Hager said to her psychiatrist, Marius Roma, one day, she said to Marius Roma, and now you're a Catholic, aren't you? And Marius Roma said, yes, it was true. So she said, so that means that you must hear the voice of God. Is that right? Maris Roma kind of slapped his head <laughs> and realized that she was right. Yes. Okay, wow, he I did voice. not know about that. Wow, that's well, a better... heard, He heard voices as well, and he heard voices in a particular kind of way, and he was involved in a discipline that was pathologizing people who heard voices in a different way. And it was from that that Maris Roma and Patsy Harker worked together to issue a call to people on uh, Dutch television to yes. come together and and to found the Hearing Voices Network to share their experiences. And they, they, they learned that there were many people who heard voices, but the problem wasn't the voices. The problem wasn't the voices telling them to do bad things. You mm -hmm. know, if you have neighbours, if you had neighbours and your neighbours were telling you to do bad things, the solution wouldn't be to get rid of the neighbours, would it? Right. No, uh, it's the same with the voices. The problem isn't the voices but it's the, the relationship that you have with the voices. Now, in 1989, uh, we brought over Marius Rom and Patsy Hag to Manchester, and we had a session with them where they described their work. And a very old traditional psychologist was in the front of the audience. He was looking very worried. And uh, at the end of the presentations, he asked Patsy Hager, surely you want to get rid of the voices. And she said, no, I'm very happy with the voices. The voices are my friends. They accompany me everywhere. Uh, they're a form of support to me. And he just could not understand this. He kept insisting, but surely you would be happier if you didn't <laughs> have the voices. He just could not get it. He right. just could not get that there were different kinds of experience and different ways of being in the world. And, and I think that's, that's what we're up against with psychologists and psychiatrists. I'll give you another example. Uh, we had a campaign in Manchester called Northwest Right to Refuse Electroshock, which is you know, against electroconvulsive therapy. Mm -hmm. And the main premise of the campaign was that people should have the right to refuse it if they wanted. You know, we knew that we wouldn't get very far if we just tried to smash all the machines. So we would actually try and build a movement uh, that would enable people have the right to refuse to weigh up, decide for themselves. We spoke to one psychiatrist out in the west of Manchester, and he said, can you believe this? He said that he would have electroshock even if he knew that the machine was faulty. 
uh, you know, this shows how steeped in these ideas the professionals are and what a lot of work we've got to do to, to actually make contacts with those who are starting to think critically. Wow, yes. Um, and again, I mean, um, adding to some of the things that you were saying, you're kind of pointing at this this intrinsic defensiveness from uh, experts in the field, uh, mostly, you know, and, and understandably so sometimes because they devote so much time and uh, sometimes uh, money to get these degrees and then to be told that a lot of what they've done is not even applicable to the people they're working with, let alone, you know, people across the world can be quite threatening. This also brings us to, especially since you were talking about the hearing voices, the idea that not everyone who hears voices, they, they across cultures, their voices are not even necessarily scary and bad. Um, and I think Lerman and uh, her colleagues have found that, that voices in other cultures very often tend to be sometimes boring, telling them to make their bed or something, or, you know, more, um, more pleasant. I remember uh, she talks in her paper about um, a person who said if the voices were not there, they wouldn't have the good advice that they did and they would probably end up dead. It's fascinating, for the lack of a better word, that psychologists trained in traditional traditions um, find it difficult that there is an alternative way of uh, relating with these voices. You also talked about this, the right to refuse movement. Um, and that kind of brings me uh, to this interesting thing around service user rights, right, since uh, you referred to those. Um, and the place of language in psychology, because I know a lot of your work has been on discourse and language. Um, and you've said that paying attention to language and going back to language is a form of, is a political move almost, right? Because psychological theories can conceal and reveal what they want. For example, um, in a recent um, article that just came out a couple of months ago, the author was talking about the concept of anosognosia which is the language uh, the biomedical model gives to lack of insight into your own condition. Yeah. And it creates this interesting catch-22 uh, in which if you uh, agree that um, you have a brain disease, then, you know, um, you have a brain disease, you agree. But if you don't agree that you have a brain disease, that it's in your, you know, it's a biomedical thing, then that's a symptom that you definitely have that brain disease. Yeah. Um, and it's, it, and now that we have language for it, we have this word anisognosia, it immediately lends uh, credence and weight to kind of this absurd thing in which there is no way out. Either you agree and you take the pills or you don't, then you definitely take them. So that said, uh, could you speak a little bit about um, the place of language in this whole discipline of psychology um, and uh, why do you call going back to language and paying attention to language a political move? Well, the language is bound up with practice. Uh, the language always has consequences. Language isn't only a description of the world, mm -hmm. but it always has effects on other people. You know, when we, when we, not only when we issue commands or give orders, uh, but but the language always frames experience in a certain kind of way. And when a when a psychiatrist makes a diagnosis, that diagnosis is is a use of language and it has effects on uh, the, the person that, that is being given that diagnosis. The, as a result, they're going to end up on a certain kind of medication or a certain kind of treatment. So the language is bound up with power. And that's, that's what we've always been interested in, in our work on discourse. Discourse is basically just the organization of language. Mm -hmm. We're always using discourses, discourses of medicine, or discourses of care, or discourses of charity, or what about it, discourses of resistance as well. We're always using different kinds of discourse. And what we were interested in, in our uh, academic work, was the connection between discourse and power. Who has the right to speak, and who is reduced to a kind of object when certain kinds of discourses are used? Now, is this, is this goes back a long time. It goes back to the origins of psychiatry and way before we go back to the 19th century when psychiatry was developing, for example, as a medical system of knowledge. Then, uh, uh, well, one example is that when uh, slaves were running away from the, trying to escape from the plantations right. in the United States, the psychiatrist had a 
their own word for this. Mm -hmm. uh, they called it drapetomania. Drapetomania. What does it mean? It just means the tendency to run away, the tendency for the slave to run away. Oh, how, what a bizarre thing that is to right. give a psychiatric mm -hmm. label to describe a perfectly understandable form of resistance and rejection of oppression. Uh, and that, that's what we're faced with present day. Yeah. And again, uh, especially in the context of psychology making its way uh, into places and cultures where, um, uh, as a and taking over the, the the many forms of discourse that people have for themselves and dealing with the way people deal with suffering, which brings me then to the question that this this work that uh, you've been doing, you know, for a large part of your life. Uh, placing psychology in a socio-political context, uh, the cultural sensitivity, and all of these things. Given the current climate of everything, uh, what do you think is the importance of doing this work right now, uh, specifically at this time? Well, what it means is uh, finding many, many, many different points of resistance to what is wrong in the world today. Mm -hmm. We're not going to be able to do it by retreating into one political party which will have all the magical solutions. I think right. we've learned that that leads to disaster and actually it won't work. Um, but what we've got to do is we've got to be able to enable people themselves to find their own points of resistance, whether as in the factory or it's in the home or it's in the clinic or it's in the prison, wherever it is. And so because I was trained to be an academic, that's what I did when I was an academic. I tried to find those points of resistance in the academic world. Now, that doesn't mean that that academic work was any more important or profound or radical than other kinds of things going elsewhere. It just meant that that's what I was trained in and that's what I was able to do. So this is just my, this is just my, little, my little patch that I'm talking about here. I think the, the key thing is to then be able to connect that with the other kinds of resistance that are going on inside psychiatry and uh, broad, more broadly uh, in, in the social movements that are uh, challenging racism and sexism, uh, homophobia and so on, uh, to be able to connect those different movements in alternative networks mm. where people have the confidence to speak about what they're do doing and sharing the ideas that they're developing from their own little points of resistance. That, that's, that's the thing. If the points of resistance remain isolated and separate, then we're not going to get anywhere either. It's going to be a connection between those different networks that enables us to, to, to make a difference. Thank you for answering that. Um... I have just a couple of more questions, and the next one uh, is of special interest to me, at least. So, uh, you know, I think in 2018, your book, Psy Complex and Question, came out, and you spoke about a new psychoanalysis, which does not care about individuals adapting to their society, but instead it questions how we think about normality and normality. And uh, given your interest in Marxism, and as many people might think that psychoanalysis more than anything else, is an interiorizing discipline, at least the way most people know about it. So could you speak just kind of really quickly about um, what do you mean by this new psychoanalysis uh, that is politically and socially aware and cognizant? Well, it took me a long time to arrive at this, um, and I was very reluctant because I could see that there were people who were moving away from psychology and uh, becoming interested in psychoanalysis, and then turning into evangelists for psychoanalysis, right. <laughs> you know, and the, they were actually going from the frying pan into the fire. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you're absolutely right. You know, psychoanalysis is a mainstream practice is as bad as psychiatry and psychology. Um, and in some ways it's worse because it makes people feel responsible for their problems themselves as mm -hmm. something deep in their own unconscious or their childhood or, you know, something like that. Um, but there was a movement um, developing in uh, France in the 1940s and 1950s around the psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan, L-A-C-A-N, Jacques mm -hmm. Lacan. And uh, he, he uh, shifted focus from biologically wired in 
ages and stages of development and development of the ego and all that kind of thing. Right. He shifted attention from that to language, to our relationship to language, to the way in which when we learn a language, that language enters us and frames how we think at a very deep unconscious level, as well as how we think consciously. Now, that opens the way to connection with political movements, because if it's language that defines who we are, and if it's our relation to language that is the most important thing, then surely, as we change cultural conditions, and as we change languages, as we change ways of speaking about the world and describing the world and and doing things to the world with our language, as we change that, then surely that will change ourselves as well. So you have a possibility of thinking about the intimate connection between personal subjectivity and political processes. Right. That, that, for me, is what is opened up by uh, the work of Lacan and Lacanian psychoanalysis. But, and this is a big but, <laughs> Jacques Lacan was trained as a psychiatrist. And a lot of these new psychoanalysts who follow his work uh, are still embedded in a kind of quasi-medical, psychiatric way of thinking about people and diagnosing people. So we've got to take the next step now. We need to connect uh, with the political movements and do something more radical with these uh, psychoanalytic ideas. That, 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 that it's just starting now, but there's space here opening up, and that, that's, why, that's why I'm interested in that. So in my practice as a psychoanalyst in Manchester, I never make diagnoses that I give to my patients. Mm -hmm. uh, I open a space for people to speak about their experience in a way that they've never spoken to anyone before. And in that process, something transformative happens as they hear themselves speak, as they hear themselves repeat certain words and phrases, descriptions that they've been given, then they start to be able to distance themselves from those terms and descriptions and phrases and to open up a different way of living. That, that's, that's what I do. Now, of course, it's confined to the clinic. And as they go back into the everyday world, then they, they come up across the old forms of patholo pathological labels that, right. that they encountered before. And so it's a kind of twin track approach. Therapy on its own won't solve anything. We need a broader social therapy uh, that, will, that will change the world and change the conditions that give rise to so many forms of distress. And we need to uh, develop forms of support for people who aren't able to cope. We need right. genuine asylum for people who need time out, time away from the world, time to reflect time to have space uh, to, 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 to be on their own, to be with others in a different kind of way. I wouldn't pretend that a future society will be paradise, that socialism will solve all the problems, mm -hmm. and never pretend that. But I would say that a future society will be more humane in the way that it provides spaces for people to be able to deal with their distress. That's what we aim for. Right. And that's why one of the main initiatives that I've been involved with over the years is called Asylum, Asylum Magazine. Mm -hmm. It was a, a magazine for democratic psychiatry. Now it's called a magazine for uh, radical mental health. But it, Asylum Magazine takes the notion of asylum seriously. It, it doesn't want to tear down all of the asylums. It wants to reconfigure things so that the old medical asylums are done away with, yes, but that people have genuine spaces of asylum where they can be who they are as human beings and then find ways of reconnecting with other people and reconnecting with the world. Absolutely crucial. Thank you. Um, I had heard about the Asylum magazine, but um, I just suddenly realized that I, I never really got into reading it. and. Yeah. Oh, it's still going. Right. It still uh -huh. appears, appears four times a year. Um, it's, a, it's a collective that produces it. 
Um, we have issues on racism, sexism, anti-capitalism. Right. Um, austerity was the was the last mm -hmm. one. Yeah, you can find it online as well. Um, oh. And uh, I, I have spent some hours of my life scanning the old <laughs> copies so they're available uh, on the website. If oh, you look wow. at the Asylum yeah. website, look, uh, just look up Asylum magazine, uh, Democratic Psychiatry, you plug those kind of phrases into Google right. and you'll find Asylum magazine. And, okay. uh, and you can see articles and you can see old back issues of the magazine. Thank you. Um, yeah, I would absolutely do that. So let me then come to our last question. And I, I know you answered this and um, you, you did in the beginning, you kind of answered this question, but I'm going to end with this. Um, there, is, there has been a debate within critical psychology and, and you know, just among people outside the discipline about whether we can make traditional psychology and the old paradigm better, or do we want to get rid of it altogether? And uh, in the context of mental health, especially, where do you stand and why? And lastly, are, are there, is there anything in the whole, the way the old discipline is done or the old paradigm is there that gives you hope and you think can be salvaged? <laughs> Not much. <laughs> and, and, and here, here I, you know, I have different differences, differences with my uh, comrades, my colleagues, my friends who are involved in the Asylum magazine. Uh, some of them would say, that there's a possibility of developing alternative forms of knowledge from within psychiatry, from within psychology, um, and that we need to think positively about that. I'm, I'm a rather negative person. Um, <laughs> and uh, I would say that, uh, you know, we used to say that charity, uh, charity is perfume in the sewers of capitalism. Mm. Um, and, and I would say that, that psychologists are, are the kind of, they think that they're social engineers, but psychologists are really the maintenance men uh, who keep the, keep the sewers in place. Mm -hmm. um, they pump all our, our distress down into the sewers and try and deal with it there in that private, private space inside each individual. Uh, I, I really think that psychology is completely bankrupt and needs to be <laughs> done away with. Um, and some people have said, when, I, when I've put forward this argument, some people have said, well, well, hang on. Um, you know, if you look at the people in prisons, and uh, then sometimes people in prisons use the sewers as a way of escaping from the prison. But, you know, that really only happens in films like The Shawshank Redemption. Right. It's very, very rare. And, and usually people go into the sewers to escape and they get drowned. Uh, it, it, it doesn't work. Uh, we've got to find a completely different way of addressing what it is to be human. Uh, so I think psychology is a complete dead end. Psychology right. is a discipline that developed at the same time as capitalism. And here you can see my connection with Marxism coming mm -hmm. through here. We need to get rid of them both. All right. Thank you for that. And thank you for this whole interview. Uh, it was great having you here today. Are there any last comments or remarks you want to make? Oh, well, no. Thanks for listening to me. Good luck with the project. Mad in Thank America you. is great. Thank you again. Thank you for listening to the Mad in America podcast. Visit madinamerica.com for more news, views and updates.